Uh, I think it's a rich um, bio. It will take really an hour to go through that. Um, but his area is his, uh, he has PhD from MIT in theoretical physics. And after that, it seems like he wasn't, you know, he was quite pleased with the cold weather, moved a little bit up uh, in Itaca, New York, and went to Cornell University for two years. And it seems like he, was, uh, he wasn't even happy with that coldness. He moved further up in Canada. Um, so he has been in Canada since then, and he's full professor of physics. Um, I look at his publication on ResearchGate, and obviously as an economist, it was hard for me to, to make sense of uh, you know, um, the, the, um, uh, the works that he has done it, but the many, many publication in physics. But then what really attracted my attention, I think in, in last 10 years, perhaps, I've seen several publications on Islam, science, philosophy, and, and within this area. And I said that even when I look at chronically, I said this, it seems like, uh, you know, after perhaps he got his tenure, he became more free and engaging on those in publication as well uh, and publishing on those areas. Now, uh, though, uh, I want to briefly tell you how we came across to Professor Hamza. Um, he actually, um, you know, when I sent him invitation because of the publication on Islam and science, um, for our existence and meaning program, he um, really looked at the program and was, uh, um, you know, interested in the program. And he decided to join us. And he has been with us for this semester, for this spring semester. And so I, I should tell you that, um, you know, he is um, he's a co-instructor in our class with us. We have uh, benefited from his participation tremendously, both in my class and Professor um, uh, Alpaslan's class as well. Um, and out of the discussion, then one day he mentioned that he has, uh, you know, something on Islam and science and, and he can share with us. So I did not miss the opportunity right after that. I, and I sent the message to uh, Professor Alpaslan and we set this meeting um, to listen to his presentation. Now his presentation, um, as you can see from the title, it's basically it's about modern science and particularly I think it's going to talk about uh, some issue with modern science and uh, from Islamic perspective. And then he's going to talk particularly about evolution, I think, as a case studies. Uh, what well, we're going to do the structure of the meeting. We're going to listen to him uh, approximately for 45 minutes for his presentation. Then after that, we'll have uh, 45 minutes for Q&A. Meanwhile, I will monitor the chat box, any comment or question, I will take note of them. And once the presentation is over, I will give, we will give priority to those questions and comments. And then after that, we will open the floor for anyone who has a comment or has a question. And again, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, the floor is yours, Professor Hamza. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min shaitan wa rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala sharafi al-Mursaneen. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in ila yawm al-Din. Allahumma a'limna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima a'lamtana wa zidna ilma. First, I'd like to thank both uh, Professor Aydin and Professor Apaslan, uh, correct me if I say it correctly, um, and forgive me if I didn't say it correctly. Maybe with time, you know, very often I say, I say I grew up, um, I grew up with, uh, with the French language, but now um, English has taken over and Arabic is, uh, is coming back very strongly. Maybe, um, today's talk, um, I, um, I, it's a long talk, and I have a lot of slides that I prepared uh, with time. However, the talk is going to be divided in three major sections. The first section, and I can, um, I can share with you the outline, the outline, the first section is basically talking about the crisis of modern science. And the word crisis, I put it in, in between quotes, because some people think it's a real crisis. Some people think that it's a, a quiet time uh, in, uh, in science, in fundamental science. I'm not talking about, uh, um, so I'm talking science that is relevant to any subject like epistemology 
or the um, the meaning of things. Um, so the first section is going to be about this crisis that physicists in particular have been talking about for the last 20 years, maybe a little bit longer. The second part, um, I'm going to talk about the philosophy of science, but in a much modern, modern sense. So I, I'm, uh, I'm going to go as far back as Popper, but there are quite a few other philosophers of science that have come along in the past 10 years in particular. And I will not focus too much on this aspect because I think I am not a philosopher and um, it is for philosophers to speak about philosophy. Uh, I am just, um, I, I'm just an amateur who is interested in, uh, in, uh, in questions, fundamental questions. And I like to see what philosophers have, have to say. I have a son, um, that I have three kids and the middle one was trained in philosophy. So while he was going through um, his curriculum in philosophy and he, and he, did, uh, he did eventually a master's under a student of, uh, of Kuhn, uh, he did a master's in the uh, history of science uh, and then he went to do law. So in the process, I learned a great deal. I went back to philosophy with him. So I read a lot of what he was reading. So that put me in a, in, that gave me some degree of freedom um, to see what the philosophers have been doing for, for two or three decades. The last part is I'm, a, I'm gonna talk about supposedly Muslims um, so I say supposedly because um, I find it very hard uh, from Aqidah point of view uh, that we have Muslim scientists who have embraced a Western uh, way of thought without being critical. Um, and you know, you may you may at the end of this uh, of this seminar, you may find that, uh, that some of the trends in my thoughts, are also have been have been dramatically affected by Western thought because because I I, I grew up when I was a kid I went, my my father um, who was um, who was very much into uh, into um, into education wanted um, Algeria had just gone uh, became independent and. Uh, I started, uh, I started primary school in the early to mid 60s. And then, uh, and my father was of the opinion that, uh, you know, the best education available should be given to his kids. He was, uh, he was, uh, he came, we, I come from a, a very average uh, income family in Algeria, but my, there is a tradition in my family. There's a, a, a very strong Sufi tradition in my family. So my father was very much into education. So he sent us to a Jesuit school. Of all the schools that you'd think, you know, you'd send your kids, he sent us to a Jesuit school. So I was taught for almost, for almost 10 years by Jesuits. And then, and then I went to public school just before entering the university, I went to the University of Algiers and, uh, and then I left. So just to tell you that I come from a background where being exposed to other religion is not a threat, but rather, rather a plus so that you can have degrees of freedom that, um, that, or degrees of thought uh, that you may not have uh, had if you were not exposed to other, uh, other traditions. So I will discuss the position very briefly because, uh, because I think uh, uh, this chapter of my interest in what other Muslims, Muslim scientists, or uh, I call them pseudo-Mu'tazilites, uh, pseudo-Mu'tazilites, they're, they're not even Mu'tazilites because the Mu'tazilites were far, far more um, uh, critical of what they read, of what they uh, translated, of what they thought. Uh, and I think these are not even at that stage. You know, they, the, the Mu'tazilites were, were uh, 
far more co coherent. And I pointed out in a couple of, uh, of my uh, pub uh, publishing. Then I will focus on, uh, on if I have time. I mean, this is clearly an agenda for a talk that uh, requires more than 45 minutes. And I've already gone through a uh, few minutes of just introducing it. And then I will go to the point of, of uh, the theory of evolution and what these pseudo modernist or pseudo reformist point out. And I will point out all the loopholes and I will not even use my background because, because uh, if you think of it, I'm a physicist. I'm not an evo evolutionary biologist. I'm not a biologist. So how can I speak about this subject no, when uh, this is not the domain of my expertise. So I will, I will tell you what the position of one of the top authorities in the field of evolutionary biology says about the theory of evolution. And then you can make up your mind about what you read from, uh, from, uh, from these uh, uh, pseudo-modernists or pseudo-reformists. So, any questions at this stage? If there are no questions, let me let I, me. I, I think we're going we're to let you to you know to go with your presentation first, and we'll have questions, inshallah. Yeah, then. I mean, feel free, uh, feel free to stop me because sometimes people will have ideas while I'm speaking, and then they would lose them. And if they're not used to writing them or putting them to the side. By the time I finish, they, it would have passed and they would have thought about something else. So I would encourage you to write on, um, on the chat. I, I have an open window for the chat because I have uh, several, several screens in front of me. So you, you, can, uh, you can put on the chat if Dr. Aiden um, uh, um, wants me to wait on, uh, on that, I will wait. If not, I will re respond as I go along. So. Let's start, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The crisis of modern science, and I will use the argument of authority. So let me go to the first one. This is a quote by Frank Wilczek, who is the Nobel Prize of 2004. He won it with a couple of other people. And Frank Wilczek wrote a column for Physics Today in 2018, this is 2018, I think it was 2019. I, it was a, a typo from my, my part. And he was commenting on a book by, um, by uh, Sabine Hassenfelder, who's a physicist. She's very, um, she's very oriented towards PR and she wrote a book called uh, Lost in Math. So here is what he says. He says, supersymmetry, supersymmetry, widely hailed as a great step forward in unifying our description of nature has failed to materialize at the Large Hadron Collider. Despite a decade's worth of experimentation and anticipation, dark matter has yet to be identified despite enormous efforts to detect weakly inter WIMPs. The candidates suggested by SUSY by supersymmetry or other compelling possibilities such as axions and axions is, a, is you can think of it of a model that was proposed by Frank Wilczek himself. Nor has the nature of dark energy been elucidated. Hassenfelder might also have added the failure to observe proton decay, a central prediction of mainstream unified field theories. String theory has failed to deliver con concrete predictions, let alone successful ones as have other less heralded high theory approaches. So clearly Frank Wilczek is saying what Hassenfelder wrote in her book, Lost in Math, is correct. That means we have problems and these problems are not being, uh, uh, do not have answers. So, and Frank Wilczek is, is in fact, you know, he won the Templeton Prize this year. They gave him the Templeton Prize. So he's, uh, he's richer by $1.5 million, 1.5 million euros. You know, that, so it gives you an idea. He has a Nobel Prize and he just got the Templeton Prize because he, he writes, he's a prolific writer. 
Here is George Ellis. George Ellis is a very religious man, but he is also a cosmologist of high caliber. He's from South Africa. He was trained at Cambridge, uh, England, and he's an authority on, um, on, uh, on, in physics. He says, there are physicists now saying we don't have to test their ideas. And by, mean, by test their ideas, he means experimental, experimenting. That means there are physicists who are saying we don't need experiments. So empiricism is dead, according to these physicists, because they are such good ideas. So if you have a good idea, a good idea is good enough. They're saying implicitly or explicitly that they want to weaken the requirement that theories have to be tested. Such as Susie's so supersymmetry string theory, to my mind, that's a step backward by a thousand years. So that's George Ellis. And you can, you can Google him if you want. This is, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, a, a very respected physicist. And he's published with, uh, with Stephen Hawking. He's published uh, with, uh, with many other authorities. This is Neil Turok. I, 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 I know him and I know of him as well as a physicist. He's also the president of the Perimeter Institute. And the Perimeter Institute here in Canada is one of the top research institute as far as theoretical physics and other fields are concerned. Here is what he writes. He writes, theoretical physics is at the crossroads right now. In a sense, we've entered a very deep crisis. And then he goes on and I write in red. He says, the number of parameters in the standard model is about 18. It's in fact 19, uh, 19 for some plus, plus others, I think six others that make it 25. And if you were to accept Susie or these supersymmetries where you have you include uh, more particles than the number of parameters. That means parameters that you have to assume you have from the beginning to make anything work. And if you go to that extent, you need a hundred and more parameters. So it's as if, if you want your theory to work, you need to give me at least a hundred parameters for these high complex models, you know, and uh, once you give me, and these numbers, in fact, Frank Wilczek describes two types of numbers. There are honorary uh, numbers, and there are uh, numbers that, uh, that uh, natural numbers, if you, you, you think about it. So he says that two types of constants, the constants that are dimensionless and the constants that have dimension. So, and we don't know where, where, how they get set, why when we try to measure them, they are what they are. We don't know that. So Neil Turok is saying, well, we need that much input to make our theories work. So the next one is Sheldon Glashow. Sheldon Glashow is yet another uh, Nobel Prize winner. And he said, Perhaps I have overstated the case my, made by string theory theorists in defense of their new version of medieval theology, where angels are replaced by Calabia manifolds. These are, these are mathematical, mathematical entities. The threat, however, is clear. For the first time ever, it is possible to see how our, our noble search could come to an end and how faith could replace science once more. So he, he's saying he's saying indirectly that now science has become another religion. In, in other words, it's based on faith. These are three very influential physicists, or at least um, at the, the bottom two are far more influential than the top one. The, the bottom one is uh, David Gross. David Gross is the Nobel Prize, uh, the, the Nobel Prize winner who shared it with Frank Wilczek and, uh, and somebody from Caltech. I forgot his name. Um, uh, and, and that somebody from Caltech was the, the student of Sidney Coleman from Harvard. And uh, uh, this is David Gross. So 
uh, if you can see, that's David Gross. This is Ed Witten. Ed Witten is, is believed to be, to be one of the geniuses, and uh, the modern geniuses in science, because he's, uh, he's an accomplished physicist and he's an accomplished mathematician. And, and uh, Ed Witten is based at Princeton. Um, uh, David Gross used to be at Princeton and then set up the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. And he moved, he moved there. And Joe Polchinski, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the, the students of David Gross. And he passed away. He passed away, I think, a couple of years ago. Here is what Joe, uh, Joe Polchinski says about David Gross and Ed Witten. He said, in fact, in string theory, there's a cult. There's a cult. I, I'm not saying that <laughs> there is a cult. He's saying it of mono vacuism. And those who know, uh, those who are physicists would know that this is, um, this is the discussion about vacua, vacua in physics and what are the more, um, how do you choose a vacuum? Uh, and it's related to these constants that I talked about uh, just a, a couple of slides before. Who's profit? So you see, th this is a cult and he's talking about profit resides in New Jersey. In New Jersey, he's talking about David Gross because New Jersey, uh, uh, Ed Witten, because uh, Princeton is in New Jersey or in the office below mine because Joe Polchinski is at the Kavli Institute or was at the Kavli Institute, uh, if I'm not mistaken, to the effect that some magic principle, magic principle will pick out, uh, sorry, I went, some magic principle will pick up a single vacuum, namely ours. I would like this to be true, but scientists are supposed to be immune to believing something just because it makes them happy. I'm not saying it. It's Joe Polchinski saying this about uh, Ed Witten and David Gross. So this gives you an idea about, about uh, where these authorities in the field are that clearly i mean there must be a problem then the next one is uh, i wanted to put it it's because jim baggett is not uh, is not a scientist he's a journalist with a, with a, a strong background in writing about science uh, and, uh, you can you can uh, you can google him you can uh, you can see what he puts on twitter you can see on uh, um, he's written extensively and he's been critical. He's written a couple of books, but um, uh, he clearly points to, uh, you know, now is this is the archetype of, uh, of a journalist informing the general public about the, the, the meticulous problems that physicists have uh, at this stage. So, in fact, I'll read the, the last paragraph. It says, next time you pick the last, latest best-selling popular science book or tune into the latest science documentary on the radio, television, or YouTube for that matter, keep an open mind and try to maintain a healthy skepticism. What is the nature of the evidence in support of this theory? Does the theory make predictions of quantity or, of quantity or number? of matter of fact and existence. Do the theories predictions have the cap capability, even in principle of being subject to observ observational or experimental tests? Clearly he's picked up that there is a problem. There's another journalist, science journalist. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is David Gross again. There are frustrating theoretical problems in quantum field theory that demand solutions. But the string theory landscape of 10 to the power of 500 solutions, this is the vacuum problem that they have. Solution does not make sense to me. Neither does the multiverse concept of the anthropic principle, which purport to explain why our particular universe has certain physical parameters. These models presume that we are stuck conceptually. So, a serious problem, and they recognize it. This is yet another another um, Nobel Prize winner. 
It says, um, Steven Weinberg, who passed away, I think, last year. It says, string theory is attractive because it in incorporates gravitation. It contains no infinities and its structure is tightly constrained by conditions of mathematical consistency. So apparently there is just one string theory. Unfortunately, al although we do not yet know the exact underlying equations of string theory, there are reasons to believe that whatever these equations are, they have a vast number of solutions. I've been a fan of string theory, but it is disappointing that no one so far has succeeded in finding a solution that corresponds to the world we observe. You know, and this is, um, um, you know, this is an authority. I, I, I cannot make these statements, but these authorities are making these statements. Another authority, Leon, Leon Letterman from the University of Chicago, a Nobel Prize winner and an experimentalist. He's an experimentalist. He was, he was, uh, he, he was at uh, Fermilab, Fermilab in, uh, in Chicago. So our fellow citizens often get confused about what big science is trying to do, perhaps because of what we tell them, usually in the media. For example, all too often we hear that colliders, these, these machines like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, that these colliders are built to discover extra dimensions, to confirm string theory, to, com to discover supersymmetry. He says, false. Colliders are built to uncover whatever is happening in nature at the short shortest distances and not to accommodate the agendas of various sets of theorists. He's almost, uh, he's almost confirming, you know, that what uh, Paul Feyerabend, the, the philosopher said, uh, said, you know, these, uh, uh, the, uh, the, Kuhnian, the, the Kuhnian paradigms are like a mob psychologist. You know, you have a mob psychology type of, uh, of um, attitude. Uh, Adrian Chaw is another uh, science journalist and, uh, and, uh, and he says what Jim Baggett is saying, but this is, uh, he says it about the Planck uh, satellite. Planck satellite was, was one of the most sophisticated satellites that we've had uh, in, in terms of measuring the cosmic background radiation. And he's commenting and he said at the end, so you just have to push until the models crack and they will crack. So in other words, whatever models we are proposing, these models will eventually be falsified in the sense of Popper, right? Falsified, they will crack. This is Roger Penrose, this year's Nobel, Nobel Prize. Roger Penrose gave a lecture, a series of lectures at uh, Princeton University in 2004. They called them, he called them the fashion, fashion, and then um, the faith and the fantasy. Fashion, faith, and fantasy. It's like F, 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 right? Fashion, fashion. You know, he says in science there's fashion. So today's fashion is super symmetry or, you know, and he says, that's what we want to, uh, that's what we want to resolve. We want a theory of everything. And then he goes and he says, faith, we believe as scientists and therefore, well, our theories should be okay. And then fantasy, fantasy. He says, there is a fantasy that we, we think we can get there, but we will not get there. And the fantasy is cosmological observation, the second law of thermodynamics and rigorous mathematical argument tell us that the beginning of the universe must have been extraordinarily peculiar and subject to laws that we do not see in present day behavior. Indeed, such elements are certainly present in ideas such as inflationary cosmology and the epipyrotic model that have been put forward to address these issues. But do they really address them? So even he doesn't believe that these models are working out. 
and I will save you that the problem of inflation, that, that there's a, a problem when uh, people talk about the big bang, they, they, they tell you there's a, there was a big bang and, and, uh, and they stop right there. But in fact, for the big bang theory to predict anything of what we see today, you need to have had a period in time, early time, that is extreme, that expands, in fact, uh, faster than light. And that we call the inflationary period. There is inflation. So it's as if you had a balloon and the balloon inflates very rapidly and then it, it reaches a state and then it keeps on expanding after that. To that period, you need to explain because if you can't explain it, you cannot explain the observations afterwards. So, um, so, and there was a controversy uh, in, uh, and you could see the dates here, 2013, where, where some theorists uh, started saying, wow, this inf these inflationary models don't make any sense whatsoever. And the debate went on for a couple of years. And you can see in the slides maybe later, and this is the list of, of prominent scientists, cosmologists who signed the letter uh, that was published saying uh, uh, that taking position with respect to these inflationary models. So um, these, these inflationary models are, in fact, the inflation is one of the backbones of the Big Bang model. If you, if you break the, 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 uh, the theory that that component of the theory and then the Big Bang model doesn't make a lot of sense. You need to figure out where, um, where, uh, how to fix it. So, uh, you know, the main figure is Paul Steinhardt. Paul Steinhardt is, uh, is, uh, is the fine, I think he's the Feynman professor at, the, at uh, Princeton University. And he was one of the, the, the founder, he was one who proposed inflation um, in the early eighties with, um, with Alan Guth. Uh, Alan Guth is, is a professor at MIT. So, um, uh, so inflation is a problem. Um, I will pass on, on this. Um, in fact, the comment that I wa wanted to make about, uh, about this is, uh, is written in red here. It says, one cannot claim a theory predicts an observation if the observation and the opposite outcome are both compatible with the theory. So this, this was the, one of the arguments of those who were saying uh, inflation as we know it today is, is not good. It, it doesn't work. Uh, I will pass on these because these are just uh, comments on, uh, on, uh, on this inflationary, on the inflationary model and how what are the uh, uh, what are uh, the uh, the facts and, and the non facts about about it? Then this is worth uh, putting because Alan Guth was one of the one of the proposers of uh, of this inflation. In fact, it is said that when he was up for tenure at MIT, he was he was he was about not to be not not tenure. Uh, he was I think a research a researcher. And he published the year where where decision uh, was to be made about him staying or leaving. Um, and he published and he published a paper on inflation, and it became extremely uh, cited. And he stayed. He stayed at MIT. He's still there. Uh, and and when they got criticized because that when um, when the debate on this inflationary model got criticized, this is what, what he said. He said, I think anybody who looks seriously in, in the history of science realizes that the old Popper's idea, the falsification, Popper proposed falsifying models is not the way science happens. Well, it's not convenient to him that, you know, that because Popperian science says you need to falsify. Rather, science is arena of competing ideas. And right now, inflation is by far the most widespread idea in co cosmology. 
That's what he's saying. He says it's popular. It's just popular. So therefore it should be accepted. Um, so again, you see, rather it's the same. Uh, I wanted, uh, there, was, uh, there was a comment at some point that uh, I think somebody made, um, made, the, um, uh, made the comment that, um, that science is not, that religion doesn't have any, any impact on, uh, on, uh, uh, on the way we do science. And I, I think uh, when I share, I will share my slides. And there's, uh, there's a piece here by uh, Mukhanov on inflation. And he cites something, and I will leave it. If somebody asks me a question about it, I will, uh, I will come back to it. Um, so I, I'm almost done with uh, the argument from authority. So this is, uh, this, is, um, this, is, uh, this is a slide about what the equations look like for, uh, uh, well, the, the, uh, for the standard model. And, uh, and on the side I've written the mathematical form of the standard model, uh, and, you know, what they have. So I have a slide for that. This is, this is the reductionist view of, uh, of the standard model. What we know, we know the quarks, the leptons, and we have um, the bosons that carry the interactions and the Higgs boson. This is, this is the reductionist model. If you want a picture about what we, how we see the world from a particle physicist point of view, uh, those are, this is what you need, uh, you need to, you know, the top, the bottom, the charm, the strange, the up and the down quark, and then the neutrinos, um, that they are uh, three types, and they, and we have all sorts of, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, things that we know about neutrinos, but we also have all sorts of things that we don't know about them. In fact, the standard model predicts that all the masses of all the neutrinos should be zero. And the ex uh, experiment showed that they're, they're upper, they have bounds, bounds in mass. So they may have, and we cannot explain that. The, so, uh, but people will not tell you that. It, you, don't, you don't need to know the details. Um, this is in terms of energy. Uh, I, will, I will quickly go through, um, uh, it, it will, I will show you very quickly where we stand. You know that's uh, that's the Planck scale. Um, if we go to the next level, this is the grand unified theories. Uh, that's the type of energy. If you read the, the scale, that's the type of energy that we ne you need, and you will see where where we are. This is where the limit of where we are. Today's limit is down here, as ten to the power of three GeV. This is. These theories that they talk about operate at what fifteen orders of magnitude higher. So, and this is what we would like. This is what the dream. The dream is to have a theory that works at all the way down here, and it's not happening. So the standard model, not model, uh, why is gravity so weak? The standard model doesn't answer the question. Where do the fermion masses come from? Uh, and I mentioned, um, mentioned uh, uh, few, I mean, the problem of, uh, of the neutrino mass and, and so on. How to explain the, electro, the electroweak symmetry breaking? No, no answer. What is the uh, origin of the lepton and quark families? These blocks that I showed you of, of quarks and, uh, and leptons, you know, why do they, do they uh, assemble in, in the way they do? Uh, why, is CP violate, why is there CP violation, charge parity violation? That standard model doesn't give you an answer. Quantum gravity, we, we don't know how to uh, bring uh, the theory of gravity with uh, quantum uh, theory. 
And then the cosmological constant, you know, the famous constant that was introduced by Einstein in his, in his general relativity equations. And, he, and at one point, because he thought that the universe was static and the equations were showing that it was, that, and that the universe was expanding with, um, with uh, Hubble, Hubble showed that it was expanding. And he said, this is the worst blunder uh, that he's made, the worst mistake. And then eventually people in 1998 uh, got a Nobel prize for showing that the, the, um, the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate and that cosmological constant had to be there to start with. These, are, can, these questions cannot be answered by the standard model. So um, we can stop here. And I don't know, I, I've spent how much time right now on? Uh... Around 35 minutes uh, you have spent this on this part, yes. So, okay, so no, two ways. We can, we can let people ask questions or I can go very I, I think I think given your presentation, my understanding, it might be better if you move a little bit in the philosophy of science as well, because the, so far what you presented perhaps still is begging for some question. We I guess people wonder what you what your comments about this part yeah. and it will come in the philosophy of science section. Okay. Right okay, so let's move on. So philosophy, uh, I once read about this, and it says philosophy is the art of asking questions that come naturally to children using methods that come naturally to lawyers. So very interesting. Um, um, the, 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 the philosopher of science in the Western part of the world, and in particular in the Anglophone part, because there are some French philosophers of science that are not recognized and among them is Bachelard. Bachelard uh, uh, wrote extensively about the works of Einstein, but uh, Karl Popper is the one, the one who pops out when, uh, when uh, you go into the philosophy of science. And then later on in the 60s is, uh, is Kuhn and, uh, and then Emil Lakatos, who was a student of Karl Popper, and then others that came along. Um, and this is the Popperian stance, it says the mark of a genuinely scientific theory is falsifiability. Science should make bold conjectures and should try to falsify these conjectures. Uh, there are some Western empiricists that most people are famous with, John Locke, George Berkeley, David Hume, uh, Thomas Kuhn, Paul Feyerabend, Emil Lakatosh, and they all say science may be described as the art of systematic oversimplification. That's a statement by Karl Popper. So, and this, this uh, principle has been used extensively by, um, by uh, the moderns to justify why you should falsify theories or push them out beyond their bounds. Um, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is this is probably not the point where I want to introduce it. This is the Do Dorothy Bishop syndrome. Uh, Dorothy Bishop is um, is a psychologist at I think Oxford University, and uh, and uh, she detected a trend for people who were who were moving uh, at the margin of academia who were using all sorts of methods to become very popular in, um, among, uh, in, uh, in the news. They, uh, they had access to platforms, um, uh, platforms, TV platforms, making comments. And she, and she says these uh, celebrity uh, experts, what they do, they follow certain rules. And the first one is to establish your credentials. So you're gonna have a, web, a website, you're gonna have a, a long set of uh, YouTube videos. You're gonna, you're gonna, you know, you do everything that is uh, attractive to uh, to the public, and then you find a controversial topic, a topic that is controversial. You will not find uh, a consensus on it, and then 
specify a casual, uh, uh, a causal chain. That means you think there's a, a, a causal chain that would explain how that how things in that within that topic operate. Then you avoid rigorous review. That means wherever whatever you write, you write not in uh, the respected journals or whatever. You go on the limb on the side and you publish in uh, in in uh, you know in blogs in uh, in various non peer reviewed. Um, uh, platforms, and then assemble supportive evidence. Well, anticipate criticism, but don't let it worry. And this is the recipe for becoming, becoming um, a celebrity scientist. This is the same, a, a, a same uh, statement in French published by, in Le Monde. Le Monde is one of the top uh, newspapers in France, Le Monde and Le Figaro. And depending whether you're on the left or on the right, you read more. If you're on the left, you read Le Monde. If you're on the right, you read Le Figaro. So this is 2016. And it says explicitly, explicitly what Dorothy Bishop was, uh, was saying. These are the, the pseudo-modernists or reformists that I, uh, I have uh, I've listed. I've written about what they've written and so on. And you can recognize some of them. This is Sardar, who is uh, in the UK. This is Gassoum, who is in uh, the UAE. This is Usama Hassan, who is in, uh, who is in uh, the UK as well. And he was part of the Killiam Institute or the Killiam, uh, part of the Killiam Foundation in, uh, in, uh, in England. This is Majid Nawaz, who was, in, uh, was uh, a member of Hizb al-Tahrir, was, uh, was uh, imprisoned in Egypt and let go and let go at some point, and he became, he became the guy for the Killiam Institute Foundation in, uh, in the UK and started doing all sorts of things um, when it comes to what uh, science and Islam uh, is talking about. There's, um, the other one is Rana Dajani, who is, uh, who, has, um, uh, who is in Jordan, and she, they, all these people have made the theory of evolution their, uh, their topic, the controversial topic, they used it as, uh, as the controversial topic to start, to, start, um, to start a debate. And that's why I use the Dorothy Bishop um, uh, syndrome. So these people, all of them are evolutionists. However, now, Sardar was a, as a journalist. Um, Gassoum is a, is a physicist. Usama Hassan has a, has a background in physics. Uh, Majid Nawaz has no background in, uh, in either science or theology or whatever. Rana Dejani is a biologist. None of them, none of them, except for Rana Dejani to a certain extent, that has a, a background in biology, and none of them have a, a, a degree or expertise in evolutionary bio, uh, biology. So, you know, you have these scientists all of a sudden they think that they have a blank check to write about any topic, any topic they want to talk about. And then uh, they picked up, and, you, and there is another one, a, a young one right now, who's uh, uh, Soheib, who's, uh, who's uh, in the UAE as well, has been writing about, uh, about these things. And he's been supported financially to write about, uh, about them because he's publishing these, uh, the, these stuff, this stuff. However, none of them have the expertise in evolutionary biology. So what, what, what they talk about, you can find it in books. Uh, these are not people who have spent their lives thinking about the impact of these laws, the impact of, of the field and so on and so forth. But they, they think they, they can use the argument of authority because they have some authority in one field of expertise, and they extended it to others, to other fields. So I will, not, uh, I will not go through the arguments that they bring on, but I will, uh, I will point out that they are all, all without exception, you know, they, they go back to certain resources. In, in particular, they go, they go back to Iqbal, they go back to uh, Ibn al-Miskawi, they go back to a couple of, they use a couple of arguments in, in some texts to, to say 
that uh, evolutionary biology or evolution is part of our heritage as Muslims. So uh, I will spare you the, uh, but I, I can, and al jahil in fact, uh, bracing for Islamic creationism. And, and note that uh, most of these people have had some funds from the Templeton Foundation, you know, including Gassoum, including uh, Usama Hassan through the Killiam Institute, uh, including, um, uh, I may be wrong about the Killiam Institute, but the Killiam Institute is a foundation that was uh, supported by the British government. So they have, they, they've had some kind of funds to push the agenda of, the, of uh, the theory of evolution in the context of Islam. So, and they all mention al jahiz they all mention Ibn Miskawi, they all uh, uh, they, 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 they go back to Iqbal. So uh, Muhammad Iqbal, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the Indian uh, uh, scholar. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll pass this as well. This as well, you know, th these are, uh, so, this is around the Dijani, and you can uh, you can look at. They are they they all mention Al Jahid, Ikhwan Al Safa, Ibn Miskawi, and Ibn Khaldun. In his Muqaddimah, he has a paragraph. So so I'll I'll uh, I'll go directly to these argument. Um, uh, this is uh, this is about. Uh, I'll pass this. Okay. This is another another one that they use, and they follow directly. Um, this is the argument of theistic evolution. Theistic evolution that means, uh, in a way, that God creates using using uh, using the theory of uh, evolution, the principles of the theory of evolution, and this is Dennis Alexander. Uh, Dennis Alexander is a biologist who was uh, uh, who started the um, uh, Center for Science and Religion at the University of Cambridge, which was and still is funded by the Templeton Foundation. He's um, he's somebody who's uh, who's very religious. Um, uh, he's uh, part of. Uh, uh, part of a, a whole network of religious people in England, uh, among whom is uh, Keith Ward, um, uh, John Polkinghorn. Um, so he's part of that legacy. And this is what he says. I mean, uh, he says many things and they've been picked up by these uh, pseudo reformists and pseudo modernists. So, uh, he says the homo divinis model. According to this model, God in his grace chose a couple of Neolithic farmers in the Near East, or maybe a community of farmers to whom he chose to reveal himself in a special way, calling them into fellowship with himself so that they might know him at the one true per as the one true personal God. In this model, the fall then becomes the disobedience of Adam and Eve to the express revealed will of God bringing spiritual death in its wake, a, bro a broken relationship between humankind of God. In an extension of this model, just as Adam is the federal head of humankind, so as Adam, so as Adam falls, equally humankind falls with him. Um, federal he headship works both ways. This is, this is what uh, Dennis Alexander proposes. Then you go to Gassoum, and you, if you read what Gassoum does, he says exactly what, uh, what Dennis Alexander says. Exactly the same. So I will not bore you with, uh, with uh, what is said. Now, I am going to use the argument from authority by an evolutionary biologist from the University of Chicago. He's just retired about a year ago, his name is Jerry Coyne. And Jerry Coyne was a student of E.O. Wilson from Harvard. He has, he has um, 
He has a degree in evolutionary biology from Harvard. And he spent all his career in the Department of uh, Biology uh, at the University of Chicago and retired about a year, a year ago, a year ago. And he gives lectures left and right. And if you Google Jerry Cohen, you'll find that he's debated uh, theologians, he's debated, and he's an evolutionary biologist. <laughs> you know, you look at his publication record as an evolutionary biology. He's one of the world experts. And he's, a, he's written a, a book on why evolution is true. You can look it up. Um, so he gave a lecture. He gave a lecture. And he says, evolution and atheism, best friends forever. So this is, he says explicitly, evolution and atheism, best friends forever. No question mark. This is the title of his talk. And here is what he says. The fact of evolution is not only inherently atheistic, but inherently anti-theistic. The implications of evolution are anti-theistic as well. Therefore, accepting evolution and science will inevitably promote the acceptance of atheism. This is one of his slides. It's not my slide. What is the theory of evolution? It's his slides. Evolution happens. Populations change genetically over time. Evolution usually happens gradually. Populations change over hundreds of millions of years. Speciation occurs. One species splits into two or more species. All species have common ancestry as a result of splitting of lineages from one ancestral life form. Much of the evolutionary change was caused by natural selection, which is the sole process producing adaptation, the appearance of design. The process involves random mutations. That's his slides, not mine. Then he says, we and all species are products of evolution, not an omnibenevolent or omnipotent God. The design-like features of organisms come from the mindless, materialistic process of gene sorting. That process involves huge amount of suffering, death, and whole species extinction. There is no qualitative difference between life and non-life or a moment when life suddenly appeared. Naturalism and not supernaturalism reigns. There's no mind-body dualism. The mind is what the brain does. No free will. You cannot make a choice. The choices are made by the laws of physics. There is no evidence for a soul that distinguishes us from other species. We are animals, African apes. Morality is not God-given, but partly evolved and partly cultural. There is no externally imposed meaning or purpose of life, naturalistic species, the byproduct of a natural process, living in a natural universe. This is Jerry Coyne, not me. This is one of the authorities, the modern authorities on, um, on uh, evolution theory. Ultimately, evolution is not about the scientific details. Ultimately, evolution is about God. This is Cornelius Hunter. It says, now, this is a joke, in fact, uh, that I have at the bottom. It says, atheist, he asked, if God created the universe, then who created God? And the citizen Lambda says, if, if the baker baked a cake, then who baked the baker, All right? So uh, these questions, I will leave it to you. Um, I, will, I will spare you the part where I, uh, I deconstruct the arguments from Muhammad Iqbal and, um, and uh, Ibn Maskawi. I went through the references um, one by one. I looked at, um, I looked at all the references uh, in one way or another. I read Ibn Miskawi and, uh, you know, uh, I read, um, uh, I had read Sayyid Nasr Hussein on uh, Ikhwan al-Safa 
and how uh, and how these uh, pseudo reformist modernists use the the argument of Ikhwan Safa. So I rejected it. It's part of the slides. So if you want the argument from Sayyid Hussein Nasr, you should read Islamic cosmology doctrines, and I will pass. There are some very interesting passages, so I will pass on that. Uh, uh, if you want to read uh, Ibn al-Miskawi's, uh, read uh, Al-Fawz al-Asghar. Al-Fawz al-Asghar. And in the Fawz al-Asghar, he has the arguments and they put them out of context. The, uh, when they say Ibn al-Miskawi has a theory or at least the ideas of uh, evolutionary theory in Ibn al-Miskawi, they put them out of context. So. Uh, read the Al-Fawz al-Asghar and you'll have, uh, you'll have the slides so you can, you can go back and, and see what uh, Ibn al-Miskawi says. He, he, didn't, he doesn't say what they say. And I've written about it. So um, uh, let me... Uh, um, the Templeton connection, I will also leave it to uh, the audience to read, uh, to read what the Templeton wants. And... Uh, and how they manufactured a whole program of Islamic analytic theology. Um, and they invited this certain group of people to really, really focus on what the Templeton had uh, in its agenda as far as analytic philosophy or uh, the, um, and they basically gave money to a group of people and they, um, and they funded them to push the analytic theology or analytic component in uh, Islamic philosophy, or at least to look at it as, a, as a, a component. And they gave money and some people uh, wrote, um, wrote articles and, uh, and they gave them a lot of money. They gave them uh, $5 million. You know, they, over, over five years, I think, five million or more dollars for, for it. Um, yeah, and these are access research contemporary infrastructure for collaboration. Uh, they, if you read uh, their program, it is clear that is it is a Western program. It is not uh, it is not an an approach that we as Muslims should be should be looking at, looking at. Uh, so. I'll leave that as well because this is a uh, professor, professor Hamza. Uh, if you will not mind, I think uh, if you can wrap it up, then we can move. I will to wrap the, it up. I'm wrapping it up very quickly. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and then you have all sorts of. Um, I will wrap it up. You know, this is Sardar. This is uh, the art. Uh, uh, there's a, a thinker that I think uh, a lot of people. I'm not familiar with. Maybe we in North Africa became familiar. This is Malik bin Nabi. Malik bin Nabi um, was uh, was a thinker, and uh, he he was a prolific writer. Um, and he said, "This is written in French." He says, "The cause, the common cause, of the error of the modernist and uh, and the reformist is that the reformists." did not go to the extreme of reformism. Um, and the modernists did not go as far as, uh, as uh, the, uh, to the end of the um, Western, uh, Western thought. You know, they stopped halfway. You know, they, uh, they uh, uh, so Malik bin Nabi was, uh, uh, and there is another one that I mentioned, I mentioned to uh, some in the class, it, this is uh, Mustafa Sabri. Uh, and for those who uh, do not know Mustafa Sabri, you should read Mawqif uh, al-Aql wal-ilm wal-alam min Rabb al-Alamin. This is uh, one of his major works. And I will, I, I will, I have contrasted here the definition of Nubuwa from, uh, from uh, Muhammad Abdu and the definition of Nubuwa from uh, Mustafa Sabri. Uh, 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 Abdu says, a human being, uh, this is Nubuwa, who is disposed towards the truth, theoretically and practically. In other words, does not know, but the truth and does not act in according with the truth 
and in conformity with the requirements of wisdom. This happens to him naturally. It does not require intellectual uh, intellect, intellection, fikr, or consideration, nazar. Rather, it happens by divine instruction, at ta'lim al-ilahi. If this disposition leads him to invite the brothers of his kind towards what is his innate nature, he is also a messenger, Rasul. And if not, he's only a prophet, Nabi. Think about it because this is a subtle point. Here is what Mustafa Sabari says. The prophet is a human being who enjoys a special connection with God, which is above the connection that occurs to every rational being while inferring about his Lord through the proofs of the cosmos. He receives revelation from him, and this revelation is greater than the inspiration of the world sciences to scientists and of grand projects to great people. This level of humanity is not achievable, but it is characterized by being a special favor from Allah, from God, to those whom he chooses from among his servants. You know, I, I think Mustafa Sabri hit the nail right on. Why? And, and I'll leave it to, um, to you to, um, to think about. And at the end, I have, um, I have a couple of slides. Uh, this is, uh, this is for those of you who know the perennialists. This is uh, Fritz Kof Schuon in a in a, in a in a private letter that he wrote. He says modern science is only partially wrong on the plane of physical facts. On the other hand, it is totally wrong on higher planes and its and in its principles. But it is wrong in its negations and in the false principles derived from them than in the er erroneous hypothesis deduced from these principles, and finally in the monstrous effect this science produces as a result of its initial Prometheanism. But it is right about many physical da data and even about some psychological facts. And indeed, it is impossible for this not to be so, given the law of compensations. In other words, it is impossible for modern men not to be right on certain points, where ancient men were wrong. This is even part of the mechanism of degeneration. What is decisive in favor of the ancients or traditional men in general is that they are right about all the spiritual essential points. Very important. And understanding Islam, he gives a, another context. So I will not read it and give some room to, uh, to people to think about. Um, yeah, this is this is an interesting uh, comment, but I will close with this. This is Lord Macaulay's address to the British Parliament on the 2nd of February, 1835. Here's what I, he said. He says, I have traveled across the length and breadth of Africa, and I have not seen one person who is a beggar, who is a thief, such wealth I have seen in this country such high moral values, people of such caliber that I do not think we would ever conquer this country unless we break the very backbone of this nation, which is her spirit, spiritual and cultural heritage. And therefore, I propose that we replace her old and ancient education system, her culture, for if the Africans think that all that is foreign and English is good, and greater than their own, they will lose their self-esteem, their native culture, and they will become what we want them, a truly dominated nation. That's it. Um, uh, I'll give you the floor and I will try uh, my best to, uh, to answer as much as I can within uh, my ability to answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really enjoy your presentation. I think it was uh, quite intensive. I hope everyone followed that. Uh, in the chat box, we have a three question, one comment I would like you to address first. Then we'll open the floor for anyone who wants to just turn on their camera and ask question. Uh, meanwhile, I suggest that you um, stop sharing that we can see everyone on screen if possible. Um, now, the very first one, 
Um, I think there was some question from Mr. Hamid, but I assume there's not Hamid that we're referring in your slide. Uh, and his question here, and there was uh, something about Mutazila to Professor al Fasan addressed that one, I think. But uh, his question is, what is your take on all these theories that you mentioned in the first part of your presentation? And can we have an Islamic responses to all this speculation? And that's the first question. I think it's, um, you know, it's very much... Uh, comprehensive and covering the first part of your presentation because we address a lot of examples of the problems. He's saying that what is what is your solution? Do we have anything in Islam? Well, uh, the answer is is simple. You know, uh, it's um, um, remember all these authorities or most of these authorities are non-believers. So uh, in their theories. The the uh, they remove one of uh, if they have a number of axioms they remove the axiom that has to do with uh, with uh, with a creator. It's not an axiom in their equations. That whatever they develop, they don't have that axiom. There is no God. They've eliminated God from the beginning. We as Muslims, that's the first axiom we should have. So we're following, we're following, uh, you know, we're following the, uh, we're following the trend that they have, and we do science like a bunch of technicians, or we think like a bunch of technicians who have some tools and we use them and that's it. But we don't ask the fundamental questions. So we need to go back. In fact, if you look at the at the science, science um, during uh, during the the period where Muslims did extremely well, you know, the first sciences that were developed had to do with, with how, do you, how do you figure out your direction to, uh, to the Qibla, you know, so astronomy was there. And then, uh, and then the question required that uh, we develop mathematics and we developed the mathematics that was not there previously and uh, we, we answered the question. So, I think we as Muslims have to come back and review the a priori that we have. In, and if we, we make it clear that we are not going to do science without, without believing in a creator. So if we don't, if we don't, if we don't do that, we're, we're just, uh, if they go into, uh, into a hole, we'll follow them in the hole. And that's basically it. So, uh, and we haven't had a program like that. Uh, am I allowed to okay. say something? Uh, go to the second one. Let's please, uh, yeah, uh, Professor Hamidullah, let's just yeah. finish those on the chat box, then we inshallah okay, okay, okay. Uh, get everyone. And meanwhile, please raise your hand that we can take you in order, inshallah, if you have a question or comment. Uh, the second one is uh, from uh, Mr. Nuruddin. He's saying that, uh, Professor Hamza, I hope you can explain more about the evolutionist Muslim figures like uh, Shaib Ahmed Malik and his friends like Jalal. And Jalal, who use Kalam rhetorics, including so-called Ghazali framework to support neo-Darwinism. Furthermore, what about the relationship between this sodo mutazila circles, for example, with contemporary neo-Darwinists such as Michael Roos? What's your answer to this? I, I, I'll tell you, Michael Roos, uh, Michael Roos is, uh, uh, you know, supposedly is a philosopher of science. We, uh, uh, I, with a group of uh, uh, had him here uh, a few years ago, and uh, you know he's Michael Roos wants wants to <laughs> wants to win the Templeton Prize. <laughs> that's all. That's all he wants. I don't think he answers. He answers. Uh, he's an. He says he's an agnostic, but in fact, um, uh, Michael Roos has uh, you know with the whether he's a neo-Darwinist or, or not, I think my position, my position is those who are utilizing Al-Ghazali to try to justify um, uh, some, some evolutionary uh, thought in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Al-Ghazali's writing, I think they don't understand Al-Ghazali. They just don't understand Al-Ghazali. Uh, they read, but they don't understand. 
And, you know, if you read the Ghazali and you try to, uh, a priori, you go into the text looking for the text that would support the ID with which you entered the text, you'll find it. You'll find it or you'll make it up. But try to read the Ghazali from a Ghazali point of view. And uh, they can't read it like that because they have already accepted the theory of evolution. So they are going to look in like they did with the Jahil, like they did with Ibn Miskawi, like they did with uh, Ikhwan al-Safa. The, the same text, you go and when the, the, all, these, all these writers were writing about, uh, about Tizkiyat and nafs how you, you, you go from one stage to another to another in Tizkiyat and nafs and they, and they turn it into um, a, a physical process. I, you know, I think um, the, the Shuhayb Ahmed doesn't understand Ghazali. Wallahu alam. I may be wrong, but I, uh, I, am, uh, uh, I don't think uh, when I, I read Ghazali, I read quite a few uh, uh, works from Ghazali. I don't see what they see. So... Um, uh, and uh, Al Ghazali had uh, criticized uh, criticized all sorts of you know he, he criticized uh, he criticized Ibn Sina he criticized Al Farabi he criticized Al Kindi and uh, you know in Tahafut go read the Tahafut in in details you know you'll understand you know he, the you know this business of the theory of evolution. Um, doesn't tell you where uh, where the first uh, uh, the first being came. Uh, so, how do they explain that? I don't know. And uh, and Ghazali uh, criticized the Ibn Sina for saying that the the the, 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 the world is uh, the, uh, is e e eternal. Uh, you know, um, I think they don't understand the Ghazali. They don't. They don't. Yes. And if one digs into their arguments, uh, which I don't have time to waste with, uh, with these people, uh, I, uh, I think they don't understand Ghazali. There's a comment from Shirkat Ali saying that uh, after listening to your presentation, saying that uh, the scientists acknowledge the chaos has come again. So what would you say to this? Is yeah, it well, like people, a... people don't understand that what chaos means. Chaos from a mathematical point of view, is a deterministic formalism. It's deterministic. Chaos is just, uh, is just, uh, is, is just saying what well, people don't understand. It's the sensitivity to the initial conditions. So if you start, if you start by telling me what the initial conditions are, chaos will tell you where you're gonna go. You change the initial conditions, you tweak them just a tiny bit, you change the outcome. That's what chaos, not from a mathematical point of view, it just emphasizes the sensitivity of the models, the mathematical models to the initial conditions. And that's why you, you have the famous saying, it says, if a butterfly flaps uh, its wings in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's gonna create a, 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 you know, a hurricane in, uh, in Maine or, whatever. It's just telling you that the initial conditions are sensitive, but chaos is yet another determ deterministic model. It's determinism. Okay, yeah, the, to, uh, one more question. If a Professor Arpastan is he still with us, I think he has to leave. He wants to make a brief comment. Professor Arpastan, are you still with us? Or did he leave already, he left the message? I think, I think he left. Okay, sorry, sorry. I think he wants to <laughs> He wants to thank you particularly. And uh, now that one uh, more question from Mr. Nureddin, um, two questions actually. One is, uh, what's your views of, uh, of Harun Yahya and his organization uh, in terms of the criticism of evolution? To what extent do his view parallel with the position of Hussein Nassim and other panelists uh, as an anti-evolutionist? That's one. The second one is that, uh, what is your view of Muslims who try to defend the Big Bang model on the grounds that the previous model did not recognize the origin of the universe? Uh, for as far as Harun Yahya, you know, uh, I have I have no position because he's not an authority. Uh, so therefore, 
you know, people write whatever they want about whatever they they uh, they think, and if they have the means to print it, they can print whatever they want. So, uh, and there are uh, their arguments are 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 very superficial, very superficial. So, no comments on Aaron Yahya. You know, the perennialist. If you take somebody like Sayyid Hussein Nasser, Sayyid Hussein Nasser is it's not me who recognizes that. It's the whole family of philosophers, modern philosophers, and uh, he's been uh, he's been uh, he's been recognized as um, as one of the top philosophers of our modern time. And you look uh, at his track record. His track record is of a, a top scholar and academician. So you need to listen to what he has to say. So. Uh, and he has clearly taken a position, clearly taken a position when it comes to evolution. He says, this is, this is garbage. Sayyid Hussein Nasser says it's garbage, garbage. He has the argument, you can't get the greater from the lesser. If you need to remember something about the philosophy of Sayyid Hussein Nasser when it comes to evolution, he said, you cannot get the greater from the lesser. That's that's the that's the point. So um, uh, so these, I think we uh, we need to have solid scholarship in order to move forward. And solid scholarship means you need to have people who are extremely aware of what is being written by whom, and what is the impact of of what is being written on the next generation. And if we can figure that one out and have a group of Muslims that can think about uh, in, a, in a major way about what is being written and how it impacts, then we can, uh, we, uh, and we do our, uh, our homework on, on the side and we have our own ways of looking at things, then maybe people will start looking at our way of looking at things. Another question, another question about the Big Bang. Would you like to address this as uh, well? The Big Bang, the Big Bang, you know, they were, Fred Hoyle, Fred Hoyle had, uh, didn't believe in the Big Bang. Fred Hoyle, uh, the guy who gave the name as a joke during, uh, during a lecture given my, I don't know, by Le Maître or, um, he said, are you, do you mean a Big Bang? He said, um, and it got called the Big Bang. The Big Bang is just a theory. I just gave you an example where the Big Bang will collapse if, if the component on inflation is, uh, is falsified. So, so you gotta be careful. You know, the, there are right now, there are groups, groups in, um, in, uh, who work on uh, quantum gravity and they, there's one theory called loop quantum gravity, which says there's not one Big Bang, but it's uh, cyclical. So a Big Bang, uh, you know, you start expanding, you contract, you expand, you contract, you expand, you contract, you expand, you contract. So that's uh, that's a theory. It's uh, it's called loop quantum gravity, LQG. So there's a whole group. Uh, who thinks that uh, this, this it's cyclical? So the, some say uh, that our observations of the expanding universe are local. So we see an expanding universe locally. We have, uh, globally we don't have the measures. So um, uh, so you got to be careful about about these theories. These theories are models. These models have, uh, have um, founding assumptions and uh, an axiomatic system uh, that is, and then you start building things and then you have predictions and you test whether your predictions are okay or not. Uh, whether you can go to the lab and check whether your predictions are okay. But then again, now there are theories that you cannot construct a lab to test them. 
So some, uh, and I alluded that, that, to that in uh, the early slides where I said some scientists are saying, uh, are saying, we don't need to test these things experimentally. As long as the idea is good, we, we move on. Okay, so let's get to two, uh, three questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Abdul Majid Khan, uh, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as wa uh, I am from uh, a, a Department of Islamic Studies, Aligarh Muslim University, India. Uh, I'm, I just uh, am engaged with something Professor Hamza was speaking on. There are two very important aspects he discusses. One is the crisis within the Western framework of things. Second is to how, what is the way forward? Uh, whether Muslims should be carried by the uh, that type of scholarship whom he calls as pseudo mutazilites or pseudo rationalists or anything like that, or we have to lay the foundation of a very solid scholarship, which is the way forward. And for that, as he has just mentioned, I may just give the words what he wants to say is that the traditional philosophy, restoring traditional philosophy as the centerpiece in the Islamic intellectual tradition will make the solid scholarship for engaging both the affairs of science and the other issues. And the first impact of that would be the other uh, factors of knowing the reality, they will reign the intellectual eclipse. Uh, uh, intellectual firmament, not the so-called reductionist scientific paradigm. And that also puts something positive to the scientific field where whatever the benefit is humanity can accrue from it, they can make use of it. But that needs what is the uh, philosophical foundations which were there in the medieval times and uh, which have been totally demolished with the onset of modernism and because of the superficial scholarship which has been overwhelmed by the uh, so-called ideas of reductionist uh, scientific theories and uh, we are landed where we are. So I have to say that when you talk of Sayyid Hussein Nasser, you talk of some perennialists, you are in a way emphasizing, that's a very positive thing, that led to that uh, traditional scholarship, traditional philosophical foundations be, uh, be, be stated afresh and uh, let uh, Muslims uh, thought pro process take a, uh, take a uh, uh, we can introspection and uh, build it as uh, strong intellectual foundations for uh, dealing with both the issues related to science and the others. This is my submission and maybe uh, there's any comment from Professor Hamza on this. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm familiar with the perennialists. You know, I've read uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasr is a, is a disciple of René Guénon and uh, René Guénon Abdul Wahid Yahya who died in Egypt and uh, I cited Friskov Chouan, and Friskov Chouan was, was in a way a disciple of René Guénon. But most of you who read uh, in, uh, in English should be familiar with Martin Lings. Um, though uh, you read, and all of these, in fact, uh, I, I'll tell you, René Guénon, um, uh, René Guénon, uh, the perennialists, uh, you know, uh, were, uh, were Sufis. They were Sufis. In fact, Friskov Chouan, went to René Guénon to see whether uh, they could see his sheikh in, uh, in Egypt. And he said, no, he said, you should go to Algeria and see uh, Sheikh Al-Alawi in 1934, 34 or 30, uh, 33. And Fritz Kofchouan went to uh, Sheikh Al-Alawi in, um, in, uh, in Algeria and then went back to, uh, went back to, uh, to Switzerland and, and, set, and set up uh, I set up a, a, a study with Michel Valsan and, and so on. So the perennialists have a, a certain position. Another, another one from uh, the, um, from the, uh, uh, the Christian tradition 
who is very outspoken uh, to a certain extent is uh, Wolfgang Smith. You can you can check him out. Wolfgang, Wolfgang Smith is uh, is uh, is uh, is a perennialist in his ideas. Uh, those who are in North America who are at the University of Chicago would know Houston Smith, who is uh, who is very much influenced by the Buddhist tradition and embraced a, a perennialist type of. But we as Muslims. You know, perennialism is 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 a way to look at things. But we as Muslims, I think, in my opinion, if you're not uh, if you're not anchored very solidly from an aqidah point of view, any any wind can come and take you. Any stream can come and take you. You have to be anchored. We have to to be anchored in a very very solid aqidah tradition. Uh, once we know, once we have that, uh, that uh, once we implement that the tradition in our education system, uh, I think we will see some very solid uh, scholarship co come through. For Allah, Adam. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Malik, if you can give me a minute, I think Professor Hamidullah had, uh, we have a question before you, so let him to talk, then we'll let you to go after that, because he just couldn't know how to, I think, raise his hands virtually. Please go ahead, Professor Hamidullah. <laughs> so it was very nice to listen to our Professor Hamza Sahab. We had listened to him earlier also, and when we were in the class, so his remarks and interventions were always instructive. And I was uh, thinking to just also ask questions in between, but I thought it would not be good. So, mashallah, whatever he said, it was uh, full of uh, information and uh, new insights. And he has brought the whole spectrum of, uh, you know, theories of uh, evolution and the Big Bang and the, you know, origin of the universe and everything before. Although I was expecting that he will also make uh, his own comments on various theories, although lastly he has said something. But we were just uh, left in you know, a purple exit, as someone said, there's chaos again, uh, because uh, he did not criticize all those theories. Because at, at some point of time, I was feeling that he uh, approves uh, evolution theory and uh, whatever the uh, no, 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 no. Just let me make it clear. Let, let me, me complete, make it clear. Let me complete, let me clear before let you. Let me complete, sir. Let me complete. Sir. That, that, but so, let yeah, me make yeah. it clear. I am. Oh, not one minute. One. one yeah, I say. Yeah, I have to say something more. I have to say something more. So just I, I want to just ask because you are basically man from this subject and we want to learn from you. This is your field basically, not our field, and we are just you know not very much informed about all these theories. We want to learn. Secondly, what you talked about, Shoaib Malik, we had a program with him a few days back. And whatever he said, you know, then I presented Islamic viewpoint, he could not, you know, defend himself at all. So he was saying such things which could not be, you know, accepted from Islamic point of view and from scientific point of view also. Third point, which you mentioned about Ghazali and Rumi and Iqbal and others, I have seen many people are just quoting you and Rumi. Uh, when they talk that there is some, you know, element of evolution in Islamic philosophy and theory and so on. So this seems very, you know, strange that we just want uh, really need to just justify evolution. And then we want to get credence for that from our own thoughts. And that seems very, you know, you know rubbish type of thing. And I feel that we, people like you, and uh, people who are well versed in the, uh, uh, physics and modern sciences, you need to just come out with some tangible solutions to this problem from Islamic point of view. You mentioned about many scholars whom you call pseudoscientists, but people consider their authority on the subject. So problem is that uh, how we can judge that who is pseudoscientist and who is not. So some people who are really well versed in this subject, they have to come to fore and they have to present the actual viewpoint about uh, these theories from Islamic point of view, and also to give the actual picture of these theories as well. Otherwise, people are just doing a lot of, you know, uh, guessworking, speculations, and they have created a lot of confusion. There is one great debater who has been, you know, showing that Quran has mentioned about Big Bang, and, he's, and it, is, it is about rain, it is not about Big Bang at all, but he is just throwing, you know, Big Bang through these Quranic verses. So we need to have an authentic version of uh, Islam uh, about these all aspects, rather than relying on this theory or that theory, 
and just supporting sometimes Western viewpoints, sometimes Islamic viewpoints, and that too on the basis of speculations, not on the actual researches on the ground. So these were some of the important last point which I want to say is about Hussein Nasr. Hussein Nasr, as you said rightly, that he's a panelist and at many times he's making a lot of compromises. And even he is considering Plato and others also among the prophets. And that goes against, and also he's also talking about these Akhwan Safa. He has talked about their asylum as well. And you know how much they have taken from Neoplatonism and other philosophies which were rejected by Imam Ghazali and in the, in the Taymiya as well. So in this way, we need to present an actual picture of Islam about these topics rather than taking sides with this man or that man with the West or the East. Actual picture should be you know, presented before the world. I feel that we need Islamic approach to science and without just uh, making you know, a lot of uh, reductions here and there. These were some of the comments and I want to get enlightened from you. Thank you. First of all, you know, to address all the topics in details, you can't do it in an hour and a half or 45 minutes or 15 minutes. You know, on top of it, I am not an expert. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a theologian. I'm not an evolutionary biologist. So when it comes to what I, sh what I showed, for example, in the theory of evolution, you know, they have their gurus, the Jerry Coyne guru. And he's saying, he's saying, you cannot be consistent. And by the way, Jerry Coyne comes from a Jewish background. So he, he's, so he must have been raised as a monotheist, right? So he knows what the Jews say in the Talmud about, uh, about God and, and so on. So Jerry Coyne knows that, that, that what evolution is suggesting. And I put these slides so that you, you, you don't come and criticize me for saying that it's, it leads to atheism. It's the guru of evolutionary biology who's saying it. I'm not, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but what he says is consistent with the science that is being taught at school. When somebody tells you a process is random, the first thing you ask them is to define randomness. Define for me a randomness. And if you can define for me a randomness, then we can move to the next level. Otherwise, there is no need to do that. Now, for the perennialists, you know, some of what the perennialists say is correct. And some of what they say may be incorrect. So if I have a background that allows me to... Um, to decipher between that which is correct and that which is incorrect, then I, I will listen to them. I will listen to what they have to say and then move to the next level. So if uh, Sayyidina Nasr Hussein says, uh, says something about Miriamiya or something, I, I know where to stand. And if somebody asks me, I will tell them what I, where I stand. So, uh, you know, there is uh, absolutely, uh, but if you ask me about basic science, I can tell you the science is changing all the time. The facts that we know today, today, or will be wrong in 10 years. Newton's laws are not correct. Well, they're not correct because if they were correct, then general relativity, Einstein general relativity should be, should, should be incorrect. But you, know, you, can, you can move from one stage to another. But I can tell you that, that you know, if you adopt the Popperian, everything is falsifiable. That means at some point, something will be shown to be wrong. So, wallahu uh, alam. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, Brother Malik, go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Jazakallah khair, Prof. Hamza, for your insightful uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of comments. Uh, first, uh, as you said, you, you, you just uh, admit and you acknowledge that I'm not an expert uh, in, in, in evolutionary biology. So somebody would say, okay, uh, all these things you put in your slides were just like uh, kind of, it was a cherry picking. 
you know, there could be uh, the statements from the other side, you know, because the authority is divided. It's not like uh, the people you quoted, they are the, they, they, uh, I mean, uh, they sum up their whole meaning of authority in that way, in that sense. Uh, coming to this, yeah, the, my second uh, point is, we, when we talk about the authority to position in, in, in Islam, I guess it's a really, really a challenging task. It's, it's not possible. I, I, I feel it's not possible. Uh, because after profit, people have right to agree and disagree with the people. There's nothing like authority to position when, when it comes to Islamic point of view in that sense. And my third point is, uh, I think, you know, uh, you mentioned about Iqbal, Muhammad Abdu. I, I feel, uh, you know, I have read Iqbal and I feel like they they, they started their discourse or they wrote in 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 a time when it was very critical, you know, uh, the conditions of Muslim world were very critical. I guess they were the people who, who started or at least initiated the uh, initiated the response, you know. And yes, uh, there is possibility to mistake, to make error in, in the calculation of the problem, you know. But at least they were the people, you know, who, who, who started the discourse. So I guess we need to, carry on, we need to move forward with the legacy, with corrections, with the reformations, whatever you call it. So uh, we, we need to, I mean, this is what I feel, we need to acknowledge at least what they have contributed because we know uh, Iqbal has tremendous impact when it comes to Islamic awakening in, 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 in Asia, you know? So we need to keep, keep, keep that in view, we need to consider like, they were the people who, who initiated the discourse. These were my submissions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Samza, before you address this one, uh, I think uh, Nevzat uh, has a question. He says he has to leave, and his question is about string theory. I don't know exactly. I didn't get it. Nevzat would you like to say uh, your question is about the relationship between Tawhid and string theory? Yeah, your mic is your mic is mute. Can you please unmute your mic? Yes, yeah. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, before uh, my question. It is very uh, interesting uh, theory, uh, relationship, physics, and uh, 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 spirituality relationship. There, there. Are, I think there are uh, there, there are reasonable uh, reasonable. Uh, Roots this uh, theory, uh, this uh, very interesting. I think, and uh, I think same time the uh, I have a question. Uh, I wonder about the, in uh, in USA, uh, Louisiana, the state of Louisiana. Uh, uh, there are a, a, a course, smart design course. Uh, alternatively. Uh, uh, the uh, evolutional theory. Uh, are there a uh, discourse? Do you know, Dr. Hamza? I wonder. The, uh, in Louisiana, uh, they related to only uh, the uh, 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 started in the, the court order, according to court order, oh. results of court, okay. court order, uh, start. Uh, start uh, the smart design le lessons smart design courses yeah. yeah do you know do you know yeah yeah i'm a, I'm, I'm i'm aware of uh, the court orders to start teaching uh, 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 intelligent designs in some, in some schools and so on as an alternative to evolutionary evolutionary theory I, i'm definitely aware of that i mean this is yeah. This has been historically a debate, in particular in the United States, because uh, the, in the United States it's completely polarized. In some polarized. other places, in some other places, they are not polarized and they have rejected the, the intelligent design uh, component and they teach evolutionary theory. But in the United States, especially in the South, like Louisiana and Texas, and you know, there are these court orders that are coming allowing certain schools to
to teach certain courses in a certain way. So uh, yeah, I'm aware of that. Um, yeah. Now, when it comes to string theory, string theory is, a, is interesting because it's a theory. So, uh, so it's not testable. So you can't go to the lab and test it. However, it's talking about a multi-dimensional universe. It's talking about 10 plus one, 10 plus one, uh, dimensions. It's not just three dimensions plus time. It's 10 dimensions, spatial dimensions plus one of time. And we, we don't know how to test for these. Uh, physicists don't know how to test for, uh, for uh, the extra dimensions. And it, it's just mathematically very appealing. It, when you have a mathematical tool that allows you to put to put um, and predict through a mathematical formalism things that are not in three dimensions, but in four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and 10 and 11. So th this is yet another issue with these theories. They don't operate in the three plus one space plus time, but they operate on 10 dimensions plus one. So, and the question of time, for example, nobody knows what time is. So, and how is it treated when we write equations and we put uh, and we put time in there? Time is just a parameter. Time doesn't depend on time. So it's a it's a fascinating uh, issue, and philosophers have thought about time, and theologians have uh, have uh, thought about time, and physicists don't have an answer for it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, would you would you like to also you know address what yeah. uh, Brother yeah. Malik was saying? Anything? Yeah. Else? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, okay. but brother brother Malik Malik. Uh, remember, I picked up on Iqbal because because of the passage or the passages where he treats uh, he he adopts the evolutionary picture, and he adopts it. You know, and uh, and Iqbal was a, was a modernist, so he was indeed affected by seeing the West flourishing and all the technology, and uh, and he thought by adopting that, you know, you you can move forward. And the comment I put by Malik bin Nabi is saying these modernists like Iqbal did not go to the extreme. You know, they did not accept all that. Uh, the Western thought uh, had in the, in the picture. They wanted to be have a foot on one side and have a foot on the other side. You can't do that. You can't do that because the Western thought doesn't have a, a from from a Muslim point of view does not have the 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 credence the creed of Islam. You know, tawhid and and so on. it's not there. So Iqbal may have been right about certain reasons and uh, uh, making people aware of certain problems. It doesn't mean that he was right. And I'm, I'm sure that there are people who have, uh, who have criticized uh, Iqbal's thought. And one of them, you know, I know of the works on Iqbal by Anne-Marie Chimel. Anne-Marie Chimel was, uh, was a professor of Near Eastern Studies at uh, Harvard University from a German side. And she translated a great deal of the work of Iqbal, especially the poetry of Iqbal and of Rumi as well from, uh, from uh, to English. So Anne-Marie Chimel has written about Iqbal extensively. And she, she, says, uh, she says certain things that at the beginning of his life where he was on one side and at the end of his life, he went. Uh, so, uh, and I'm not an expert on these things. So uh, I'm just telling you what I read, you know. Okay. The, the, let's, let's, let's get it very, you know, we already exceeded our time. Very last question, and Tola Hassan, please go ahead. And, and then with that, we were going to finish it because we, we were late a little bit and we give uh, 15 more minutes. And I think that should be enough for, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, of course, we should uh, be anchored to our Islamic aqidah very strongly. Of course, I agree with that. 
But my question is that when we talk about evolution, uh, we do not expect that uh, you know the physical universe evolve by itself, or animals and living things evolve randomly without God behind, and you know this phenomena. Uh, that's like uh, you know the debate between Einstein and uh, the school of uh, Copenhagen school of thought. Uh, God doesn't play dice with the universe. And uh, Neil Bohr answered that, uh, don't tell God what to do. So in this case, some scholars, which I have been following, uh, I've been trying to understand the arguments in Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, Aqidah, uh, according to the scholars, which I tend to agree that there is no single uh, definitive evidence from Al-Quran or Hadith Sahih, Hadith Mutawatir and so on, which indicate that uh, 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 evolution is, is uh, evolution against Islamic uh, principle. So are we here uh, to try to negate evolution because it contradicts Islam? If it contradicts, uh, I'd like to know which, which ayat or which, you know, which Hadith that states so. Thank you very so, much. So I'll ask you just one question. How do you define randomness? Well, I I don't know. Uh, you know best. Random, according no, to no, us, no, is no, random. No. I, according I, to us, I, it is I, random. I don't know. Yeah. Well, no, what's randomness? It's according to us, it's random. But of course, God behind all those is God choose to, to run the universe uh, like that. We may not understand everything. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says explicitly ma ashhadtum khalqa as-samawati wal ard wa ma wa ma wa ma wa ma ma ashhadtum khalqa as-samawati wa ma wa ma kuntu muttakhidha al-mudhillina adwada so how do you know how do you know how, uh, why, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani why would you make a comment about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates how why would you, you know, make? Why we, would we, you make we, that we assumption? To, to to me, you know, we would never know how Allah create. Uh, you know, the, the the truth, the truth of everything. We ne would never know. But so when why we are do you suggest? To, why yeah, do you why, suggest that He creates according to uh, according to uh, to some rules? that have been devised by somebody in the lab saying that my lab has to take 10 million years to show you one, uh, one uh, speciation. Just because we do not know, we should just go on and do research and without, you know, uh, uh, without saying that those things or the, those phenomena contradict Islam. We, do, we would Allah never know. Wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says explicitly that when he wants something, kun fayakun. And, and in Arabic, when the word fa is used, that means there is no spatial or temporal, uh, it's spontaneous. Now, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transcends time. So all of a sudden, somebody comes, he says, well, you know, now these these uh, these um, these uh, these random processes are accumulated, and after a while, you know, one species becomes another one, and another one, and another one. You know, now I, I, you and I cannot test that in a lab. I, I think uh, I, I still maintain that we would never know the the the, the reality how God creates things. Of course, okay, God so then, and destroyed then, and everything. Then, we, then the argument goes the other way around. So why do they claim that they know how God creates? We want we want to try to understand how this universe functions according well, to. You have to be consistent in your. Uh, you either you either say I don't know, or you say I want to know, and at the end I cannot know. So you have well, to you have to decide. Yeah. Okay, my position is like this. My, <laughs> my position is simple. We uh, the knowledge of today is not is not the same as the knowledge of tomorrow. Meaning there is no end. We increase our knowledge every second. 
I, we will I, never, I reach, with we that will never reach to the end. But the I point is that I disagree. I disagree from an Aqidah point of view with that statement. The knowledge that's given to us, to humankind, yeah. will never reach absolute. Be, only Allah. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you know so that? So that, the that, question that should not stop us. That should not stop us from okay. trying to understand how this universe function, whether whether through evolution mechanism or not. It doesn't matter. But the reality is Allah behind all those. We accept that. If Allah choose to run this universe according to uh, randomness or whatever you may call it, or, or, or evolution, uh, uh, let, let it be. For, to yeah, us, but to him, of not. From a linguistic, to him, of course, not. Yeah, from a linguistic point of view, we have some serious problems. You know, you're, you're saying Allah runs things and so on, as if you know how Allah... And not, what are the rules of how to run, to do things? You know, you 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 just said the debate between Einstein and Niels Bohr on uh, on probabilistic theory. He says the God doesn't roll dice. So, in other words, what Einstein was telling Niels Bohr is that he doesn't believe in a probabilistic theory. Yeah. And the theory of evolution, the theory of evolution, is a probabilistic theory. Well, that is the, the two camps that debate. But to, for us Muslim, we should not take any position. We just go on and do research. And the, the knowledge of Allah himself, that is his own. You see, unless yeah, I, there, I there is this no- debate, This debate if, can take place <laughs> Unless okay. there is very decisive, decisive Quranic verse, which is uh, not uh, to be interpreted in different ways, you mean, I mean, I mean, qat'i dalala wa qat'i thubut, then fair enough. But here, there is no such things to debate, uh, to, to, to negate uh, the theory of, of evolution. Oh, there, there is, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it's for uh, a different time to... Uh, uh, okay. okay, I think, I think okay. We, can, we, can, we can end it here. Thank you, thank you very yeah, much. Thank, I, you. I, I thank you very much, I, thank you indeed. I, I think mean, the position here is that is like, okay, what is wrong to really discuss that? I, I think, I, I don't see there's anything wrong. And that's the reason that we have such discussion. And we had a, actually, um, you know, we had a presenter, present a different point of view as well. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Suhail was here, you know, uh, and made his own point as well. And again, so, uh, everyone um, have to just look at the ideas and evidence and make their own judgment ultimately. But uh, so, so therefore, uh, I think what I got it from Mr. Tola is that he's saying, well, you know, what is wrong to ask or to, to speculate even that how God, uh, you know, function in the universe. But I think your point is that you're saying that, that we need to look at Aqidah, whatever the assumption we make, it shall has to be, con has to be consistent with Aqidah first, then we can go from that in terms of the axioms that the starting point, I think that you're putting, that put God at first and put Aqidah first and then start your assumption and then do the inquiry based on that one i think that is that's my understanding allah but i, uh, I mean there's a, just a quick point and i said it before that one of the problems is how do you get the greater from the lesser okay i, I think it's again that um, perhaps uh, we have to leave it here uh so here has about i think i said there was there will be the last question so therefore we i think we need to end it here it's already 10 minutes after six uh, thank you very much uh, and again for some of you maybe um the debate the, the, the discussion was not conclusive which is no problem is not we're not here to really like uh, to solve all this problem and get all this answer uh, i think we're here to really have uh, some honest intellectual discussion and let you go and, and do your job and do inshallah more research on that one. Thank you very much, Professor Hamza. We really appreciate uh, your presentation and um, your engagement. And thank you very much everyone for uh, such a, a interactive discussion and uh, interesting comment and questions. And we hope to see you again at another uh, NURSI webinar. Inshallah. Thank you.